Join us this morning, amen? Amen. That's a familiar song, and I could hardly hear any of you singing out there. It make me sing by myself, and you know what happens when that happens. People leave. It's good to see you this morning. Thank you for coming, and let's ask the Lord to help us this morning as we pray and give him the service uh, for his glory. Father, thank you once again for just another opportunity to come to the church house. We thank you for your grace, and Lord, we do thank you for the joy that you do bring to the world. And so, Father, we're thankful for that, and we ask, Father, that you might meet with us this morning around your word and give us exactly what we stand in need of this morning uh, for being here at the church house. We look forward to what you have to say, and Lord, we're just asking you to help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Who has a word of testimony this morning? Anybody? Pray for Anne Marie. She's not feeling well today, so she's home with uh, our granddaughter. And so, Miss Charlotte? Um, I'm just thankful that this week I had my blood pressure reading really scary. Mm -hmm. And I just thank God for that. And I know that my blood pressure Amen. We're glad that too. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Is it pressures from the new job or? I know you stepped up into management there a little while ago, right? So, <laughs> amen. Pray for Charlotte. David? Uh, pray actually for uh, a lady named Adeline. She passed away. We just had a paper plate. We were working on the rehab. And okay. She was a sweet lady. Thanks for having services for this Thursday. Um, pray for the folks that are there. Uh, Still can't get in there? Okay. Amen. Pray for Adeline's family. Yes. My daughter-in-law, her name is Tori Garcel. She's really sick. She's been down with COVID since November 1st. Um, and now she has a mass on her ovaries. And uh, she has a nine-year-old child whose name is David. Amen. Pray for her. Yes. Thank you. Dot? Amen. We still have more seats available. Yes. Jeanette? Yes, um, pray for Sean. He's traveling today. Yes. And Dana. Okay, pray for Dana and pray for Sean's traveling. Yes, Dan? Uh, thankful that I've been offered and accepted a new job at Ashford. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Answer to prayer. Amen. 
Amen. Anyone else? Hi, Isla. You snuck in and stuck behind Victor. I can't hardly see you back there. <laughs> pray for Isla. She's getting ready to have her their first child. So pray that the child will be healthy and everything will be uh, the way it should be. Amen. All right, let's have uh, Brother David and then uh, Brother David Roy, would you come receive our offering this morning? Just one other announcement. Uh, we'll have no afternoon service here this afternoon, no lunchtime, no afternoon service because the uh, downstairs is still under some construction. And so hopefully by next Sunday, we should be able to have it at least in place where we can have a service and have our lunch fellowship and everything downstairs. But uh, pray for the workers. Amen. 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 Brother David Roy. Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for allowing his breath to be here this morning. Yeah. Father, uh, we lift up those that they can't be. Father, I pray for Lana. Lord, I strengthen her, Father. I pray for Mrs. Hallett. I pray for uh, Sally Curtis. Lord, many others, Lord, that are hurting today. Uh, Father, we just ask you to bring your grace upon them. Lift up our missionaries, Lord. Father, thank you for the, the messages we've already heard today. Thank you for the Sunday school, Lord. And Father, we, uh, thank you for your patience with us. Lord, um, help us be witnesses for you as this time of year comes, Lord. The opportunities are great. Father, we ask you to please bless this offering. Lord, may it be used for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand once again, turn to page number 93 in your hymn books, 93, and remember to help me out now, sing out loud so everybody can hear you.
And you may be seated. Take your Bibles and find the book of Revelation, chapter number 19. Revelation, chapter number 19, will be our text for this morning. Revelation, chapter 19. We have been studying the book of Revelation on Wednesday nights. And uh, as I was studying this past week for next week, I came across these words and I thought they were uh, very good and wanted to uh, expound upon them this morning. Look, if you will, at verse number 7, Revelation 19, verse number 7. The Bible says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant. And of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So this morning I want to look at a few passages of scripture specifically here. In just a few weeks we're going to celebrate the birth of our Savior Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Uh, and we as Bible believing Christians do not celebrate December 25th because we know Jesus was born on that exact day. As a matter of fact, he wasn't. But we celebrate his birth because of what his birth means to we as believers. It has been a long tradition of men to, uh, to celebrate Christmas, but it's also been a tradition of men where Christians celebrate the birth of the Savior on the 25th of December. But the actual date is, is an irrelevant point. The fact is he was born, and that's why we, we give thanks to God for all that he means to us. But the object of the celebration was Jesus was born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Ghost. The shepherds and the angels on that faithful night that Jesus was born gave glory to God for the events that they witnessed and what they would mean to humanity later on. You're in Revelation. Hold your finger there. We're going to come right back there. But I also want you to look with me at chapter 2 of the book of Luke. Luke chapter number 2. If you would look there with me just for a couple of moments, we'll come back to Revelation in just a second. But in Luke chapter 2, in verse number 13, the Bible there says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. When we meet our Savior face to face, there will be praising and singing like never before. Amen. Uh, the pastor won't have to tell you to sing. You're going to want to sing. Amen. But uh, in, in Luke chapter 2, we see that the angels were praising God and, and uh, saying glory to God in the highest. And then down in verse uh, number 20 of the same chapter, the Bible says, And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. You know, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, it was a good time for them to do that. You know, it's a good time for us as well to praise God and give glory to God for the things he does for us. And in our text verses back in Revelation chapter 19 again, we see the Lamb is coming. If you look at verse number 7 there with me again, the Bible says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Uh, the Lamb of God is coming again. He will come. He will come without us having any forewarning about it. He won't announce it coming, but he will come nonetheless. The Bible makes that clear. But in our text this morning, his wife, it's notice it says there uh, in verse 7, at the end of verse 7, his wife hath made herself ready. Who is the wife of the, the, the Lord Jesus? It's us, the church, the bride of Christ. Uh, it was granted to her that she should be arrayed in fine linen and white, clean and white. And the garment clean and white pictures Christians being blood washed by Christ and attempting to live righteously according to his word. Here we see the marvelous truth concerning the marriage of the Lamb. 
This will occur, by the way, in heaven. In the Father's house, after the rapture of the church has occurred, when the Lord catches the bride away, brings her to his house in heaven, the, 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 the marriage of the Lamb will occur. It is a glorification of the bride, and, and all of the saved have had their works tried by fire before this takes place at the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. When that is complete, the bride is now ready uh, for the marriage ceremony. The marriage of the Lamb celebration will then commence. There is much confusion, though. Listen to me close. Between the marriage of the Lamb and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Many folks are confused over these two things, and I'm going to tell you why in just a moment, but some scholars and commentators and many Christians believe that it will happen simultaneously or immediately following the marriage ceremony. In other words, the, the marriage of the Lamb will take place and then immediately following will be the marriage supper. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches it will occur later. Of course, this is because, why do we think that? Because of our dominant Western culture, where when people get married today, what happens right after the ceremony? They gather together and they eat. But I'm telling you, folks, that's not how the Bible portrays the marriage supper of the Lamb. When weddings in America are usually followed by the meal and the reception, and this wedding that we're looking at here is based on Eastern customs of that day. It is going to be a Jewish wedding. And so what happens first? First, what happens is the betrothal. Praying. And so when, it, when, it, when, when Mary was espoused to her husband, Joseph, they were in what was called the betrothal stage. And Joseph left her. He went away to prepare. And uh, one of the things that happens in a Jewish wedding is the father of the groom pays a dowry to the bride's family, almost like purchasing her and purchasing the permission for her to be married. And this, perfect, this pictures our profession of, faith, of belief on Christ. When we were at that place in our life, when the Spirit of God spoke to us and we, were, and we were under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and we said, we believe that Jesus died in our place. We believe that Jesus uh, paid the penalty for our sins and we are now fully trusting him for all the eternity coming forward. He is going to take us to heaven because of his goodness, because of what he did Nothing of what we did, but we're trusting fully in that. That is also the betrothal stage for we Christians. This period of betrothal uh, it gave the bride in a Jewish wedding, it gave the bride a time to prepare. Guess what, Christians? We're preparing right now ourselves to be uh, brought to the marriage, uh, the marriage of the Lamb uh, in heaven. That will happen one day very soon, and we'll be with the Lord for all eternity after that. Uh, this period of betrothal gave the bride, though, in a Jewish wedding custom, time to prepare herself for her husband. During this time, she prepares to transfer her allegiance from her father to her husband. That's a, that's a Bible uh, concept, by the way. And by the way, the Bible still teaches that. Amen? Going from the familiar to the unfamiliar. Uh, everything that was in the bride's life that was familiar to her living with her family and her mom and her dad and all her brothers and sisters, if she had them, those were all familiar things. But now she's getting ready and she's preparing herself to go to the unfamiliar. From depending on her family to depending on her husband. Learning, listen, to love him and setting her mind on pleasing him. Amen. So here we are, we're in that betrothal stage as Christians right now. Here on this earth, in the church time, and church age it's called, we're here preparing ourselves to meet our groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the bride of Christ as the church. And we should be learning how to love him more through the study of his word and, and through uh, uh, doing things that we know are pleasing to him in his sight. You know, when you love somebody, you do things that please them. Amen? So many times this word love gets tossed around and it's very confusing in the world today. Most of the things that the world talks about that are love are nothing but lust. Love is, is action. Love is doing for the other person. After the betrothal in the Jewish wedding ceremony, then came the actual ceremony, I should say in the process came the ceremony. The groom came and stole his bride away. That was the custom of that day. Catching her away by surprise. Does that sound familiar? That's what the Lord's going to do with us, the church. He's going to catch us away by surprise, and we're going to rise to meet him in the air. That's what the Bible teaches. And the ceremony will then take place at the Father's house. 
The wedding ceremony was only for very special guests. This is where a problem begins when comparing customs of today with customs of the Bible. When looking at scripture, we must be careful not to confuse what is commonplace today that we know about regarding weddings, as with weddings then. It's a totally different situation. So we see the bride of Christ, the church, she's arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, according to Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. And for weddings today, by the way, just think about this with me for a second. Weddings today, the focus is all on the bride. Amen? Her dress, her train, her flowers, her jewelry, her socks. That's a little different. But the groom plays little part in the actual ceremony and weddings that we know about today. Matter of fact, he's told what to wear, when to be there, and even where to stand once the thing commences. Amen? Those are Western customs, folks. Those are not Eastern customs like we see in our Bible about the marriage here to the Lamb. The third phase of a Jewish wedding was the wedding feast. And the Bible calls this the marriage supper of the Lamb. This Jewish wedding feast took place in a completely different location. It was attended by the wedding party, and it was also attended by some very special guests who were invited by the groom's father. So we have a hard time imagining here uh, this scene that the Apostle John is seeing here, and he's writing, as, as we recorded in, in, in the book of Revelation, not all Christians live like we Americans. Okay? When the bride of Christ, the church, is united with the bridegroom, Jesus, at the marriage of the Lamb, it will be a glorious event like nothing before it or will be after it. The church, the bride of Christ, will then uh, with the, with Christ, uh, return with Christ from heaven back to earth after the seven years of tribulation. This is known as his second coming. And Christ and his saints will put down all opposition to himself. Once his enemies have been made his footstool, then Jesus, with the help of the Father, will then set up his earthly kingdom and will rule and reign for 1,000 years over all the world from this throne in the millennial temple in Jerusalem. This is what the Bible refers to as the kingdom of God. When you see those words, the kingdom of God, it is speaking about the millennial reign of Christ on this earth. You know, post-millennialists believe... There's, there's several different groups of people who believe different things about this, but the post believe that it is the job of the church to establish the kingdom on earth. And once it's made ready, Christ comes and takes it over from the Christians. That is not Bible teaching. That is what the world is teaching these days. Many churches teach that, but it's not biblical. This is a heretical teaching. It was a theory espoused by a Unitarian preacher in the 1700s. It's not what the Bible teaches, however. At this time, the millennial temple is described in Ezekiel, beginning in chapters 40 through 48. It will be built by Christ himself. The Jews are not going to build the millennial temple. There's a lot of confusion in our world about that, too. But the Bible tells us very clearly that the Lord himself will do that, not the Jews. The Jews will not be the builders of his temple. Christ will do that himself. But before all of that takes place, here's what we want to get to today. The Apostle John is given a front row seat from heaven to observe all of these events as they unfold and as he writes the book of Revelation. And as it takes place, John was, has witnessed the events in heaven. He has witnessed the events as they have occurred on earth. And Jesus will be the center of attention with the church. From his vantage point, he has seen earlier events of God's judgment on the sinful people of the earth as it will unfold in the future. He is instructed then to write down what he is witnessing. And that's where we have our book of Revelation. It is John, the Apostle John's, uh, 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 what he is witnessing and as he is writing, he is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And that means he is writing exactly what God wants him to write. But I want you to think about something with me for a second. Imagine the Apostle John's thoughts as here he sits in a front row seat in heaven, looking to the earth, watching the events unfold. 
Think about his perspective just for a moment with me. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine watching all of these things for the very first time and seeing as it unfolds, he has most likely outlived most of his contemporaries. All the other apostles at this point are most likely either dead or martyred. And, and of, of, he's, he's one of the only ones that's left. John is currently imprisoned as he's writing this letter here in the book of Revelation. He is, he's imprisoned on the island of Patmos, yet John is allowed a trip in the spirit to heaven's throne room which is a picture of the rapture for we Christians. And John has lived to see the church on earth come under intense persecution. He has been told that the believers are to be overcomers. He has, been, he has seen the crucifixion of Christ firsthand, the persecution of the other apostles. He's seen it. The church at its birth, he's seen it. He has watched and has lived to see the church scattered abroad under the persecution of the Roman authorities and many others in the world who just simply hate Christ. He's watched all of these things unfold. And yet here he is again. He's witnessing this glorious scene from Revelation chapter 19. His attention is now focused back on the throne room of heaven. Look with me at verse number 7 again. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give honor to him to the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted, listen, that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints." The marriage of the Lamb unfolds as promised. There is gladness and rejoicing in the Father's house in heaven. Everything, listen, is as it should be. The perfect wedding coordinator, God himself, he has choreographed this entire ceremony. Everything is in its place. Everyone is there that should be there. No one comes running in late through the door as the ceremony is, in, is taking place. Everyone is where they should be in their place. And here's the problem. John is in such awe over all of that he's observing. He's so mesmerized by what he sees, he must be reminded to keep writing what he's witnessing. Look at Revelation 19, verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, keep in mind, I said that he's so mesmerized. Have you ever been in something and been watching and observing something? And you get so tuned into it that you kind of forget what's going on around you? That's where John is. And the angel has to remind him, keep writing, keep writing. And John is, is writing here, and, and we see in verse number 9, I want you to see here what it doesn't say. He said, they which are called. See that? And he saith unto me, write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. They which are called unto the marriage supper, the word called in that verse in its original form is a verb. It is the Greek word kaleo, which means in every instance it's used, it's, it's denoting an event that will take place in the future. Not right then. And so when John says, they which are called unto the marriage supper, that means it's going to take place in the future. Not yet. Let me give you an example of how this word is used in other places. Look at, you don't have to look, I'll read it for you. Exa another example is Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. And the Bible says, and she shall bring forth a son... And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Was he born at that point? He was not. But he was going to be born in the future. And the Bible says here, thou shalt call. In other words, when the event takes place, this is what I want you to call him. Every place in the Bible that this word is used, it is depicting a future event, not yet in existence. Our modern Bible versions substitute this word called in Revelation 19 verse 9 and they replace it with the word invited. What's the difference? In so doing, what they're doing is they're lumping all of those in attendance at the marriage supper together with no distinction. And there's going to be a distinction. First of all, let me just say this, not everyone invited to the wedding shows up. 
Look at Luke chapter 14. I need you to see this. Luke 14. <clears throat> Look at verse 16 and 18. 16 through 18. The Bible says, Luke chapter 14, verse 16, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it, and I pray thee have me excused. And if we were to continue reading in those verses, you'd see more excuses being made. What's the point? The Lord Jesus, when he came to this earth, he died on the cross, and he gave an invitation for all man to believe on him and what he had done. But the truth is, we know this, not everybody will. Not everybody has. But we as believers have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Many have been given the message of the gospel only to reject it with some excuse. They're focused on all the wrong things. They're focused on the world and, and all the things that the world offers. But those of us who are born again have trusted and believed on Christ unto salvation. We are now part of the, bar, the bride of Christ. So we have an invitation. We have, a, we have a, a calling, I should say, to the marriage of the Lamb. And we will be also at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But this means... But I want you to understand, this in no way means all people who profess to be Christians will be at the marriage of the Lamb, and they will not also be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why is that? Because not all people professing Christianity are born again. There's a difference. If you're a member of a church of, of, of a, a Protestant persuasion like the Lutheran church or the, the Episcopal church or the Catholic church or some other church, that is a, a denominational uh, a church that, that claims Christianity, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not going to be part of the Bride of Christ. You have to be born again to be part of the Bride of Christ. Your participation in the ceremony as part of the Bride is dependent on you knowing Christ as your personal Savior. Look with me a little bit further down in Luke 14. Look at verse 22. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. In other words, if you were invited to be part of the family of God and you rejected, just because you were invited doesn't mean you're going to be a part. You have to be called to be part of the, the family of God. And that's what the Bible teaches us in the book of John. The Father is the one that draws, or you might say calls us to salvation. And that call can go out to anyone at any time when the Spirit of God is at work in a person's life. But that doesn't mean necessarily that the person will respond the way that they're supposed to respond. You know, I didn't need to invite my bride to my wedding. She didn't need to invite her groom. There was never any question we both were going to be there. The changing of the word of God by these supposed scholars and theologians to me is nothing but arrogance. When, when Bible scholars decide to change the word of God on their own behalf to make the Bible say something that they want it to say, that is nothing but arrogance. It's, 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 it's basically saying to God, you don't know best, I know better. And that's why we believe uh, the Bible is to be left alone and it's to be taken literally. Back to Revelation 19 again. Look with me at verse 9. He saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. You know that word call that we looked at just a minute ago in Revelation 19 means to utter with a loud voice, to call out by name, their presence is assured. When Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples... On the night before he was crucified, he made the following statement in the book of Luke, chapter 22, verse 17 and 18. He said, and he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. You know what that kingdom of God is? 
It's the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ. That's when he's going to uh, drink again uh, with all that are believers, all that are Christians, all that are part of his family. He is going to sit down and the marriage supper of the Lamb will occur at the, the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. In a parallel passage, Mark 14, he says something else similar. He said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The millennial kingdom is a real Bible truth. But there are many today who do not believe that it will actually happen. They think it's just spiritualized away. They think it's an allegory or they think it's some other thing. But the Bible clearly tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ will reign and rule on this earth for 1,000 years. And we that are believers will rule and reign with him. Uh, the, the, this location for the marriage supper of the Lamb will take place on earth, not in heaven. If you read a lot of commentaries, and I know some of you do, you're going to see many commentators who tell you that this supper takes place in heaven. I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. If you're called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, it is because you've been born again. You're part of the true church, the body and bride of Christ. John chapter 3, verse 3, you know this verse. It says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That pretty well seals it, I think. If you're not born again, if you've never been uh, born again and trusted the Lord for your salvation, you're not going to be in the millennial kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ, which means you're not going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Not only will all born-again believers be there at the marriage supper, representing the bride of Christ, but also there will be some very special invited guests. There is a distinction between the bride of Christ and those guests made in the Bible. I'll tell you more about that on another time. Revelation 19, verse 10. The Bible says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When John sees what occurs from his, remember I told you a few minutes ago, he's, he's watching these events take place. He's so mesmerized by all that's happening, he forgets to write, needs to be reminded to write, and the angel tells him to write. But when he sees what occurs, he is overcome by an intense desire to worship himself. So he wrongly falls at the angel's feet. And what does the angel say? He tells him to get up, basically, and stop worshiping him. Falling at angel's feet, by the way, is never commanded in Scripture. We're not supposed to be worshiping angels. That is not of God. That's of the world. There's many traditions that tell you that angels will do this and angels will do that. And, and many people wear little angel pins around their neck and all that kind of stuff. Angels are nothing but servants of God. They're messengers. And right here in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, the angel says to John, Don't you dare worship me, because I'm nothing but a servant just like you. Falling at their feet is never commanded. So John is quickly told, to get up, stand up, don't worship me, I'm just a messenger. How did John let that happen? You'd think that John, being a man of God for all these years, you'd think he would have known that. You'd think that he would have seen enough of the way that God works, that he would have understood that he's not to worship angels. But see, here's the problem. John is so overcome here by what he's watching, he forgets. You know, emotions can lead us to do a lot of things that are not biblical. And so we have to be careful. If they're not checked by the word of God, we can find ourselves involved in a lot of things that God never intended for us to be involved in. And the angel quickly rebukes John, and John obeys. You know, we began this morning with an admonition to save the date. There's a day coming when we as the bride of Christ, the church, will rise to meet our groom in the air. There's a marriage ceremony that will be happening very near in the near future. We don't know exactly when it'll be. Can't even really say it'll be near future. We don't really know. But we know this, that when it happens, it'll be quick. 
We won't have an opportunity to say goodbye to people that are unsaved. We won't have one more chance to witness to people because when this uh, rapture occurs, when the bride is raised to meet Christ in the air, it'll be quick, quick, quick. You're not going to have any opportunity to set things in order. That's why we need to be letting people know today. You know, our responsibility as Christians in this world that we're living, we're supposed to tell people the good news, the gospel. We're supposed to let them know about these events that we've been talking about this morning. And I know I've gone, you know, relatively quickly, but I want you to understand this. If we do not do our part, people that we love, people that we care about, will not know what they need to know. They're depending on, God is depending on us to tell them. If we're doing our part and we're, we're making sure that we're, we're covering the information that we need to cover uh, and, and, and at the same time trying to live out our faith and live out righteously according to God's word, uh, the question we must ask ourselves this morning is this, am I honestly really doing my part? Or am I making excuses? Do I really care enough about my loved ones to make sure that they have the information that they need in order to be born again? Whether they're born again or not born again is not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to tell them what they need to know so that they can be born again. But once you've delivered the information and told them that they need to be saved, then it's up to them. It's the Spirit of God that does the work in their heart and brings them to the place where they can honestly trust Christ as their Savior. But if they don't know about any of it, they can't do it. See, we've got to stop force-feeding people and just simply setting the table before them and saying, here, here's why you need this. Here's what you need to know. Our friends... Our loved ones, co-workers, all the people that we have opportunity to meet, all the people that we have opportunity to reach, we need to make sure that they know that there's a date coming. The marriage ceremony of the Lamb, the Bride of Christ reuniting with, with the Lord and living with all uh, for all eternity with Christ, uh, ruling and reigning with Christ in the millennial kingdom and all those things, they need to know. And I'm telling you, most people don't have a clue about any of this stuff because they've never taken time to look at a Bible even one time. Our part is telling the truth. And if we've done that, we have done our part. We're, are we seizing every opportunity that we have to tell others? about Jesus. We must push aside our own selfish desires, our hang-ups. And let's just face it, a lot of times the reasons that we don't tell people what they need to know, because we have hang-ups. What are the hang-ups? Well, you know, I just, I'm embarrassed. I just don't know what to say. I don't know whether if I say something it's going to make them mad. Would you rather have them burn for all eternity in the lake of fire? I don't think anybody here wants that. we got to tell them. But once we tell them, then we just have to let the Spirit of God do the work. Don't keep pestering them. I don't know about you, but when I was first introduced to the Word of God and to the church and to some of the things that I've been talking about this morning, you know what I thought? I thought it was a bunch of baloney. But the person that gave me the information, continued to pray for me, continued to pray that I would understand some of the things he was sharing. And he was very kind and he was very generous with me. And he would just give me little things every once in a while. Here's a roll. Here's a little turnip. Here's a little mashed potatoes. And before you know it, you know what happened? The Spirit of God began to do a work on me. And those things that I thought were baloney, all of a sudden became a reality. And I could see things that he was telling me were true. And I could see the testimony in his own life. 
I could see the testimony in other Bible believers. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God brought me to the place where I humbled myself and basically allowed the Spirit of God to take over and I was born again into the family of God. Folks, that could not have happened had I not been shown the Word of God. Because it wasn't His words. It was the words that I read in this book that brought me to conviction. And that's what we have to be doing and that's what we have to be about. We've got to be showing people the truth from God's Word. Let them see it for themselves. And I believe without a doubt if we'll do that, we'll see more, feet, more folks come to Christ. Because remember, the Lamb is coming. Would you stand with me for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you once again for another opportunity. We thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you for all that you do for us each and every day. And Father, we know that without a shadow of a doubt, if we'll just give people the word of God, that your spirit and your truth will do the rest. Help us, Father, we pray for that one in our life that we have not witnessed to like we should have. Uh, Lord, lay a person on our mind and heart this morning that needs to know the things that we've talked about today that we haven't told them. Father, help us this morning. Give us the courage and the boldness to be able to speak the truth in love that more people might come to know you as their Savior. Father, we want everyone we know to be at that marriage ceremony as part of the Bride of Christ. We want them all to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb when we rule and reign with Christ for 1,000 years. Help us, Father, we pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming this morning. It's a joy to be at the church house with our church family. Remember, uh, Friday, December 9th at 5.30, uh, that's a Friday afternoon, uh, we'll have our church uh, Christmas fellowship and gift swap. If you would like to take part in the gift swap, you can still come to the fellowship if you don't want to be part of the gift swap. But if you do, ladies should bring a gift for a lady, and then men bring a gift for a man and try our best to keep it down under ten dollars uh, we don't want to uh, be buying expensive things but just the fun of doing it is kind of interesting to see what people can come up with for that short amount of money it's always fun to see uh, but we want you to be a part of that that's december 9th at 5 30. Uh, the church will have a meal and we'll have some uh, side dishes and things like that and we'll be able to enjoy our our new kitchen area downstairs and uh, hopefully everything will be ready for that and looking forward to what the Lord's going to do. Invite somebody to be your guest at that. Their guests are also welcome. And so if you know somebody that is in the area that uh, you'd like to invite, be, be happy to have them come as well. So that's Friday, December 9th at 530. Um, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, and you're here this morning, 
We would love to be able to take a Bible and show you from the Bible how you can also know their Lord as Savior. We'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you personally, privately. Uh, we won't embarrass you or anything like that, but we'll be happy to show you. If you'd like that, let us know as soon as we're uh, finished this morning. No afternoon service, no lunch fellowship, so enjoy the rest of this day. I think it might rain this afternoon, so while the sun is out, do your best. Amen. Let's be dismissed in a word and ask the Lord to help us as we go this morning. Brother David Burnell, would you dismiss? Father, as we leave this place, Lord, we pray that, uh, first of all, you keep our eyes on things above, Lord, our affections on things above. I got caught up in this season, Lord, for all the wrong reasons, Lord. You're the reason. Pray now for each and every family here that prayers that were offered up.